the law tonight. But um, also, we talked a little bit about how rest, the, the, the Sabbath rest, is a picture of the rest that we have in the gospel. They were to have faith in God and trust Him to be their provider by resting one day in seven. And in Hebrews, we made this connection that, that um, when they failed to believe the gospel, they failed to enter into God's rest, Hebrews chapter 4. So you, you've got this, this um, in the crucifixion of Christ, we'll see it's an act of murder, that, that uh, theft is involved, particularly with Judas and the Pharisees. We're going to see that it was spiritual adultery. We're going to see it was, it, was, um, it was an act of covetousness, and it was an act of bearing false witness. I kind of went out of order there. Um, so let's go on and, and look here, and, if, and we'll look at the, the second table of law. This isn't working. My clicker's not working. Ah, there we go. Let's go on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward to where we get down to the second table of law here tonight. And we're going to look at, all right, so here we've got the second table of law. You shall love your neighbors yourself. Here they are in, in five commandments. The, the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. The seventh commandment, and you shall not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, and you shall not steal. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth commandment, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. That's the second table of the law. And I want to look at them piece by piece tonight. So if you've got any comments or whatever, then jump right on in. Who has the mic, by the way? You have the mic? Good deal. All right. So let's look at the first one. You shall not murder. Uh, you'll, we had a discussion about this last Friday. If you have an old King James Bible, what does it say? You should not kill, which is confusing because there are people who literally take the King James Version and they'll say, well, you shouldn't deer hunt because that's killing. But that word, there is a difference in Hebrew between the word kill, like to kill an animal, and the word to murder. It's a different Hebrew word, ratzak which means literally to dash in pieces, to kill a human being, uh, especially to murder, put to death. Uh, what in the world? You did that? Are you getting the iPad going? Is that what you're doing? All right. Um, put to death, kill, manslayer, murder. The Hebrew word covers causing human death through carelessness or negligence. So sometimes it's not. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, oh, excellent. Sometimes it's not talking about hating someone in their heart and, 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 and murdering somebody. Sometimes it is manslaughter. But it's not, it's, it's, um, uh, it's always, the, it it's always refers to taking a human life resulting in their death. Homicide. We'd sum it up as homicide. It, it doesn't simply mean, uh, and it doesn't apply to the death penalty. So when God requires in Genesis 9, he says, He that sheds man's blood, of man shall his blood be shed. That, that is, he doesn't, it doesn't say to murder the man. The, to execute a person is different than the word to murder. So literally the commandment is you shall not murder. Anybody have any comments on this or questions? All right. Um, I'll say something else here too. That, what's the distinction? So let, let's say, here's, here's an illustration from the law. Two friends are out and they're chopping wood. And the axe head flies off. And a man kills his friend. That, that is manslaughter automatically. But it's not necessarily a death penalty offense. And, and the distinction is, does anybody know what the distinction is? When is it, when is it an act of... Uh, when does it call for, for the death penalty of the person that killed his fr uh, the person? And when does it um, flee to the city of refuge? Does anybody know the difference? Yeah, it's, if it was an accident or if it was done on purpose, and there's a phrase that says, if, if he hated him in his heart formerly, it's, an, it's considered an act of murder. 
So the distinction between an accidental homicide and an act of murder is the person has an evil mind to do the, the wrong. So if a person hated his brother, it's not an accident because he wanted him dead, right? Now that's very interesting because of what Jesus says in the New Testament. He really helps us get to the spirit of the law behind murder in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, And you have heard that it was said by those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be, in and be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So you notice Jesus, what Jesus is doing here is, he is he's pointing out that people have, have oversimplified the commandment not to murder. And he says, you know, really what makes an act of murder, even if no one dies, is the hatred in the heart, the anger in the heart. Because the anger is the seed that grows and blossoms into murder. So before Cain murders Abel, Cain hates his brother in his heart. Cain is angry with God and angry with his brother. That's the motive that is, and, and envies his brother. That's the motive that drives Cain to murder his brother. And so what Jesus is basically teaching us is that since motive, motive is the distinction between an accident and an act of murder, therefore God sees the intent of the heart even if no death occurred. And what he's wanting us to do is as believers is to stop the sin not merely externally, but to deal with the heart that leads to the sin. So, so if a person doesn't actually murder anybody, but they're angry with everybody, and they wish they, were, they could kill people, and they would if they could, but they won't because they're scared of the consequences, that still makes you a murderer in the eyes of God. What he's doing is he's showing that the heart of man, even, even people that don't ever carry out, the act of murder, if you walk around with a hateful disposition towards your fellow man, God says that is a murderous heart. So somebody cuts you off in traffic and you want to give them the middle finger and call them a bunch of names, that's exactly where Jesus goes here. He says if you, if you say to your brother, you're a fool, today's terminology might be, you idiot. Or you say, raka, kind of like, oh, I hate that guy. Jesus says you're in, you're in danger of the council. That was the group that could put you to death. Of course, you wouldn't literally in a civil realm be, be worthy of the, of the council. But what he's really teaching is, is he, he's showing that generation that God looks at the heart behind the crime. And if we really want to have a righteousness that pleases the Lord, we have to deal with our heart, not merely our externals. Because it's relatively easy to deal with externals. But the heart is the level God wants us to deal with sin at. He wants us to deal with the motive behind the sin. The seed that grows into the tree. Because an angry heart, if you took all the restraints of civil law away, uh, there'd be a lot more murder than there is. And what evidence is this, one, one great evidence is this is, People who were known as nice people get a whole lot of power without any accountability and they turn into murderers, right? So you got, you know, maybe, maybe when Stalin was an 18-year-old, if, if you could show him the future and say, you know, you're going to be, you're gonna be uh, responsible for 120 million deaths of your own people, he might have been horrified. Why? I would never do that. But give him power, take away all accountability, and he starts to think he's a god, and he, he eliminated people left and right. Same thing with Pol Pot, same thing with Hitler, Many, same thing with Mao in China. You take away the restraints of law, and, and, and the human heart manifests itself. But Jesus wants us to get right to the heart of the issue, and the heart of the issue is the heart. And the heart of murder is anger, etc. So that's... Um, so Jesus says, if you bring your gift to the altar and then you remember you've got an issue with a brother, before you come and worship God, make sure you make it right with your brother because God looks at the heart.
right? All right, well, that's the sixth commandment. Yeah, please. I feel like I'm feeling rather alone. I'm glad you're speaking up. <laughs> I'm stumbling. I got a lot technology issues. I, I could see you needed rescued, so I'll help you out. Thanks. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I think that in this, in this law, so you mentioned when an axe head flies off and someone's, someone's dead, you know, there's obviously going to be a court case. Just like today, if you're driving and you hit somebody accidentally, there's going to be a court case. You know, whether you're guilty or not is up to the court to decide. And like God's law says, it has to do with prior intent. And so you think, well, because I'm just thinking in my mind, well, how would they know if this person hated this person or not? How would they know if there was prior, prior intent? You know, because you could envision this scenario. There's two men out in the woods. There's no one else around. They're chopping wood. The axe head flies off. It hits somebody. And so the judges or whoever, the jury's asking around, well, how do we know if there's prior intent or not? Really, the only way to, to tell that I can think of, and maybe there's others, I'm curious to hear people's thoughts, would be, you know, asking the, the murderer, I'm going to call him the murderer for, for sake of the conversation, you know, asking the people in his life, hey, did he ever say anything about this person? Did he ever act in a certain way about this person? And, you know, really the only way to tell if, if he was angry or had prior intent, or maybe even wasn't, didn't have prior intent, but was angry at this man was by what he said. And so I think Jesus is also alluding to that by kind of making us really think, you know, unfortunately we don't practice this law in our justice system, let's say we did, really keep a guard over our mouth on what we say about other people. Because let's say I'm in a conversation with somebody at, at a restaurant and I'm going off on this guy. I can't stand this guy. He's, you know, he's so mean to me. I have to work with him and he's just angry. I, you know, he, I just hate this guy. I, I wish he would go away. Well, let's say some accident does happen at work, you know, and the friend who's having that conversation is like, actually, I didn't hear him talk about how much he hated this guy. You know, I know I'm going long here, but <laughs> hypothetically, if that situation would take place, then maybe the axe head flew off unintentionally, but because he expressed hatred for that person, the law makes it sound like he is guilty of murder. Not necessarily because he tried to kill him, but he was angry at him, and the axe head flew off and it did kill him. So it's, it's not in a sense, well, was it an accident or not? It's was it an accident, but also did this guy have prior, did this guy desire him to be dead anyway? So I think it, I just, all that to say, I think it really, you know, anger needs to be dealt with at the very start, you know, before it blossoms into or more like decays into filthy talk about another person. Because according to God's law, if you're talking hatred about somebody and there does happen to be some accident, a lot of times the people we can't stand the most are the ones we work with because we deal with them every day. They're often of different families, different, you know, cultures, different worldviews than us or whatever. But just keep a guard over, you know, in our hearts what we think about other people because God's law says that if you're angry at this person and even if an accident at work happens and he dies, according to God's law, you'd be responsible in some degree for murder. Am I taking that too far? or I don't know. It's a very interesting point. I'm just trying to hypothetically I, think. I, I think it's a good way of looking. It, I, one thing it does say is be, live in such a way that if an accident or did occur, people say no. Exactly. You know? And I think Jesus is saying that too. Yeah. For I say to you, everyone that is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So in a sense, there's if you're angry at somebody and you're expressing that and an accident at work happens where it looks like you may have done something or may not, like you said, be above reproach. Yeah. Make sure that all your friends, all your anyone who, who might be aware of the situation can say, he never said a bad thing about that guy. There's no way he would have ever wanted this to happen to that person. Right. Otherwise, character it is leaves it messy. A person's character and history comes into it. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I think that's a very good, it's a very good point. You know, even, even today, you have to prove motive in a court of law. Do they have a motive to commit the crime? There's no motive. It's one of the things that they, they and a prosecutor will do is look for motive. Was he going to get an insurance claim, or what, what was, the, what would be the motive for it? Was it a crime of passion? And uh, I think that really the intent of the heart does, does show. Jesus, in another place in Matthew 12, he talks about out of the abundance of the heart, not only does the mouth speak, but... Uh, out of the, the heart proceeds murders and fornications and adulteries. The heart of the matter is the heart, and, and God sees it that way. And um, we should be very careful to deal with 
the heart and not merely externals. Because that's what the Pharisees did. They were all about the external. You know, just, just the external. But the heart, and I'll come back to the Pharisees and their, their thing on it. I'll skip a scripture here. Oh, but here's another one. When it comes to Christ and the death of Christ, it's interesting how the sixth commandment applies to this. He's talking to the, the scribes, the Pharisees, of his day in Matthew 23 he says therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes some of whom you will kill and crucify and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar truly I say to you of these things all these things will come upon this generation O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered you, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. So Jesus says that ultimately what it comes down to is that generation was going to actually kill, do, perform the, the ultimate murder by crucifying Christ. And he said as a result of that, all the blood, all, every murder that's ever happened points to this murderous act because you're killing the image of God, the real image of God. It's interesting that the reason why murder is condemned in Genesis 9 is that God made man in his own image. And, and therefore, he that sheds man's blood, of man shall his blood be shed. Well, Jesus is the very image of God. And when, he, when God shows up, they want to murder him. So all murders somehow point to that ultimate murder of, of Christ. And he says, as a result, all the blood of every murder that's ever happened is going to come upon this generation. So it points to uh, Christ in that way. Um, I could point to others as well, but I just wanted one scripture that points to that the, 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 the crucifixion of Christ was the ultimate murder because the ultimate image bearer of God, when he shows up, mankind wants to kill him, right? Uh, any other comments about thou shalt not murder? We can go on to thou shalt not commit adultery. Just a quick one um, about the the word in, in both the New Testament and the Old when Jesus reiterates the, the Sixth Commandment and in the original Sixth Commandment as well. The Hebrew word doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture where, you know, God does the killing or it's a just killing it's, it's never in those situations. It's always a wrongful killing where it shows up in those scriptures. It doesn't have all of them, but it's always, if it, if it is showing up at all, it's always for wrongful killing. And same thing for the New Testament. It's not, it never, it, it's not, it doesn't show up for, you know, when Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira were killed, although I don't know if that, that word was used. I think it just says they fell down and died. But, I mean, it's never used for any righteous killing, any killing uh, that was commanded. It's always for. It's always an unlawful. Yeah. So that's, those words are, are the, the words in the Greek and the Hebrew, the word that was used for kill was, you know, wrongful murder. Excellent point. Excellent point. So it's very clearly not the word kill. It's not a, a just execution. It's not, uh, it, it, it's always a manslaughter, an act of violence, a wrongful taking of human life, always. Um, so you can't use thou shalt not murder as a case against the death penalty because the death penalty was given for murder <laughs> in Exodus 21. And some people try to do that. They take the word kill and say, well, if it's wrong, if it's wrong for your people say, well, you're, if, if the state puts to death a murderer, they're no better than the murderer. That is absolutely false according to Scripture um, because God required the death penalty for the murderer and the, not the same word is used. Okay. All right. Well, let's go on to the next one here. Um, we come to the seventh commandment. And you shall not commit adultery. Now, adultery is a violation of uh, the covenant between husband and wife. And God oftentimes use it, uses it also as a picture of the covenant that he has with his covenant people. So in the Old Testament, when God's people commit idolatry and they go after other gods, God will say, you're playing the whore. You're, 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 you're an adulterer. You're an adulteress. Even in the New Testament, I didn't write down this one, but in James chapter 4, 
Uh, James is talking to believers. And he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And what he's saying is, is that um, if you are in love with the world, you're not a faithful bride of Christ. And it, it's spiritual adultery. So adultery becomes a powerful picture of idolatry. Because in the same way, a wife or a husband is jealous over their spouse and wants to protect that love. God uses that as an illustration to Israel. When you go after Baal and Ashtoreth and Milcom and, and uh, these different false gods, it's an act of covenant infidelity that, that hurts God's heart like adultery heart hurts a spouse's heart. And um, that, that becomes an illustration in the Old Testament. Um, Yeah. 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 It's a violation of that covenant relationship that we have with the Lord. So, you know, in one sense, when you come to the communion table and we're, it's like a covenant renewal every week. We're remembering, I belong to Christ. I'm His. And so if, if, if something in the sermon points a spotlight of idolatry in our heart, I'll say infidelity in our heart, um, our, as believers, we should be broken over it and say, okay, God, I need your help with this. I need you to defend me because I've been unfaithful and forgive me and cleanse me and wash me. But it's a very powerful illustration that God makes clear to us that we're his people. He doesn't want to share us with Satan. He doesn't want to share us with the world. We're his people. He loved us and he gave himself for us and therefore he wants us to be a faithful people. And I, I, you know, once in a while I'll meet people that, like I know some very precious people to me that used to seem like they're on fire for the Lord. And today they're not on fire for the Lord. I don't even think they're going to church. And they're back, they're back in the world. They're, they're gambling. They're getting drunk. Their, their lives were a wreck. And they'll say, well, you know, once saved, always saved. I, I made some commitment back then. I'm all good. But the heart, and I do believe in perseverance of the saints, but, but the heart is like, eh, it doesn't matter. He'll forgive me. God, the Lord our God is a jealous God. He doesn't want to share us with the world. He did, it, it's like a husband didn't want to share his wife. A wife didn't want to share her husband. God loves his people. He gave himself for his people. It's not appropriate that we should just with a nonchalant attitude say, well, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and God will just have to get over it. That is, that's like adultery to God. Um, furthermore, right after the scripture in Matthew 5 about murdering the heart, the heart behind murder is um, anger, unjustified, unholy wrath. In the same way, Jesus gets to the heart of adultery. So in Matthew 5, 27, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So what he's saying is, is listen, if you are having these fantasies in your mind, that shows the intent. That's the premeditated part. Even if it never happens physically, the intent is there. Remove the restraints of society and remove the constraints of, of the civil law and remove the constraints of the consequences and the sin would be permitted. The only thing restraining isn't an internal love for God, but it's fear of consequences. And Jesus says, if that's going on, then, then you've committed the sin in your heart already. Again, I like to compare it to a seed. The seed doesn't look anything like the tree it grows into. The acorn doesn't look like the oak tree. It's not a miniature oak tree. And, and, and yet, 
everything necessary for an oak tree. It's information. The DNA is in that seed. If you give it proper conditions, it will grow into an oak tree. And so it is. The adulterous heart, the murderous heart, the covetous heart, the larcenous heart, the heart is the seed that grows into the action. So Jesus wants us to say, I know what that is. That's an acorn. And I don't want an oak tree here, so I'm going to deal with the seed, right? Deal with the root of the problem so it doesn't grow into the problem. Externalism, religiosity, will take chainsaws and cut down oak trees. But Jesus wants us to say, no, at the heart level, anger is murder. Sexual fantasies are adultery. Um, more than a yes and a no is, is an act of blasphemy. Jesus is showing that, that the heart is the issue that he wants us to deal with our sin at. And also, this, this is very humbling because, you know, you may say, well, you know, I, I went to high school and everybody around me was committing fornication and doing drugs and beating people up, and I never did any of those things. And what Jesus is trying to show is, okay, but in your heart, Give an opportunity. Maybe you just weren't good looking enough. <laughs> Maybe you were just too scared. Maybe you just had um, the constraints of family and society that kept you back from the sin. But God looks at the heart. And, and the purpose of the law, one of the maiden purposes of the law is to humble us. So that we're not a Pharisee that thinks we don't need the grace of God because we see ourselves as better than, than the woman who couldn't even lift up her eyes, but she, she washed Jesus' feet with her tears because, because she saw herself as, as, as a sinner in need of grace. So that, that's what the law does. It should humble our hearts. And he basically does the same thing in the next verses with adultery. It was, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual morality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Jesus takes this command not to commit adultery. And he says, you know what? You think a little piece of paper changes all of that? And, and, he, and he's showing that, you know, if, if someone, um, even divorce in God's eyes many times is, is, is an act of adultery in God's eyes. Many times. I, I do believe there are scriptures that say that if you've got an unrepentant adulterer, that there's a place for divorce and remarriage. Um, if the unbeliever departs, 1 Corinthians 7, there's a place for divorce and remarriage. I believe that. But you've got to realize, even when a person says, well, they're justified, you're justified in getting remarried, realize that it's still uh, unnatural. Because God's intent was that for that marriage bond to last for the entirety of a person's life. God's intent was not that the divorce bond be broken for light and trivial reasons. And it's getting really ridiculous. It's getting to the point now where, you know, somebody, uh, they, they've gone and said, well, okay, it's for, for adultery if the unbeliever leaves. And now they all say for abuse. And abuse can be emotional abuse. And emotional abuse can be raising your voice at some point or, or, or um, looking at pornography. And if they, if they did any of those things, you're just free to pick up and move on to the next person. And the marriage bond has been very discounted, very uh, undermined. It's been greatly undermined by no-fault divorce in our society. And so instead of people fighting for their marriages, the first difficulty, it's uncomfortable for them, and people are giving up on it. And God doesn't want his people to do that. He wants us to fight for our marriages and be faithful and sometimes suffer. Yeah, that's right, even suffer. There's a place for suffering in the kingdom of God. Um, I'm not saying that, uh, that a person, uh, let, let's say someone is being battered, man or woman. Sometimes men get battered too. It's not talked about much. But sometimes the woman's the aggressive. But either way, man gets battered, woman gets battered. There is a permission in 1 Corinthians 7 to leave and remain single. But today people are like, oh, excuse, to, the marriage is getting rough. I don't feel the same feelings I used to have, so I'm, I'm jumping ship. And Jesus makes it clear that, 
that uh, it's, it's unnatural. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, which means that he's guilty. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Because no matter what, God, when God makes two one, his intent is that they stay in union with each other. So um, anybody have any questions about that? Stephen? Yeah, just, just a few thoughts, and this is kind of some ideas that have been coming to me as we've been going through Genesis. I mean, it's been a few weeks or probably months now, but, um, you know, the, the marriage relationship is created because it's a picture of the relationship that Christ has with his church. You know, it's the way I've been thinking through, the way I think I used to think through it is like, oh, yeah, you know, marriage uh, basically marriage first, and then it's the picture of Christ and church. But it's actually the total opposite. The relationship between the Trinity and Christ and the church existed first. And out of that understanding, God created marriage. Mm. And this helps us, I think, you know, during difficult times of marriage to remember that um, as we at times suffer in marriage, you know, as we at times maybe are sinned against or, you know, go through difficulties or are, you know, or, or sin or whatever it might be. Um, and as we persevere, or as we remain faithful, as God gives us grace, we are reflecting Christ to the world because we're reflecting the way Christ suffered for his marriage, right? We're reflecting the way that Christ was sinned against in his marriage. And by marriage, I mean what he's done for his church. Christ suffered for his church. Christ was sinned against and continues to be sinned against by his church, and yet he is faithful. He's, he doesn't go anywhere, you know, and it's, it's kind of laughable. You hear statistics that the divorce rate or the separation rate or whatever within the church is the same as without. Like, that's horrific. You know, Paul says that shouldn't even be named among you when he's referring to sexual immorality within the church. And, you know, faithful marriages are such a picture of the gospel to the world. And I just, I want us, you know, married and even the unmarrieds when you are married to remember that, you know, when you're going through hard times in your marriage, it's so important that you do remain faithful and just ask God to help you do that because as you suffer, you are reflecting the suffering that Christ did for his church. As, you're, as you forgive when you've been sinned against, you are reflecting to the world that Christ is able to forgive them because we've sinned against Christ, you know, and on and on and on down the line, you know, Christ endured the cross because of the joy set before him, you know, so as we endure tribulation or difficulty in marriage with joy, I'm, I, I don't know that I've ever done that, but I'm still working on it, you know, enduring difficulty with joy, that is reflecting Christ to the world, and there's real power there, and I don't know that that's really recognized or talked about enough, but you're right, marriage is a picture of the gospel, and as we as a church have faithful marriages, and out of those marriages, you know, bear fruit, which is often children, we are reflecting the love that Christ has for his church to the world, and it does help evangelize the world and spread the gospel. It does. You know, we, we believe that. The Word says that because God created marriage out of his nature, out of his image. So it's just just some additional thoughts about just the importance of marital faithfulness. And obviously, we all have different backgrounds and stories and different things that God has brought us through, but um, it's just, this is, I just think, one of the most important things um, in the culture that we live in where it's becoming, so many people, why do I get married? What's the point? Who cares? If two people love each people other, who cares? Yeah. Why does it matter? Well, it's, and people say, oh, well, it's, you know, it, it's just makes for better cultures. It makes for stronger societies, blah, blah, blah. You know, secular people or even Christians try to explain the importance of marriage from non-biblical terms, and they flop. I mean, it's embarrassing, actually, when you see a Christian talking to, like, Joe Rogan or whoever, and they're trying to explain why marriage is important between a man and a woman, and they don't use the Bible. And, you know, you just kind of want to smack them. It's like, no, marriage is a picture of the way Christ loves his church. That's why marriage is important. That's why marriage is a thing. That's why societies operate better and, you know, with marriages and whatnot. So that's my soapbox. <laughs> no, it's a great soapbox. You can stay on it if you want. I think it's so important. And, and in our culture, we've idolized uh, our own self-fulfillment and our own happiness. And there was a time, our ancestors understood there's an element of duty there. Right? It's not always about how you feel because uh, God, as you're pointing out, 
when we fail and we fall short, we're so grateful that God bears with us and loves us. When we're faithless, yet he abided faithful still. Um, because he set his affection upon us and he loves us. He loves us through our infidelities and our failures. He, he calls us back to himself. And so I think you're so right. I think that, that marriage is a picture. It is a, it is a gospel picture. And, um, and I think it's a very powerful one to a generation that's totally confused even what marriage is. It's just lost. Zach, did you want to say something? So I know you mentioned uh, two uh, purposes for divorce, including uh, unrepentant sexual immorality. Uh, whenever you're talking about the whole abuse thing, I was curious. I've been told the view of how uh, church discipline could be applied to that, where it's like they're uh, separated, but then uh, she brings him or he brings her to the church, and they confront him once, and then they confront him twice. And the whole uh, congregation confronts him, and if not, he should be sent away as an unbeliever, and uh, in that case, be applied to the First Corinthians seven fifteen passage. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that? Um, on on, a, on abuse, like like verbal abuse. Okay. Well. Okay, this is really tricky stuff. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, I think it deals with a couple different categories. First of all, he says if, if a person has an unbelieving spouse that's content to dwell with them, then to stay in that relationship. But if the unbelieving departs, then you're not bound in such cases. Bound by what? Bound by the civil union. So here's the thing. In Corinth... They, a lot of their marriages weren't marriages in a church. They weren't all Jews, right? But they, they called each other. However Romans got married, whatever ceremonies they used, when one of them got saved, Paul, you know, they're like, wait a minute here. I wasn't married. I wasn't married like the Hebrews are married. I wasn't married in a, in, a, in, a, in a church like Christians are getting married. So what do I do if my unbelieving, I've come to faith in Christ and the father of my children isn't even a believer. What do I do in that situation? And, and Paul says, if your unbelieving spouse is content to dwell with you, stay with them. You know, you may win them by your godly lifestyle. He says, this, Peter says something similar in 1 Peter 3, to wives with unbelieving husbands, try to win them through your, your manner of life. Without, that, that those that don't believe the word can be won without the word by the godliness of the wife. So uh, it says, if, if the unbeliever, now, how many of those unbelieving husbands were abusive? And yet Paul is saying, stay with them. He says, if the unbeliever leaves, you can remarry. But he also says, if, if, you, if, you, can't, if you can't stay, but the unbeliever doesn't believe, so let's say that the person's just a monster, then, then you should remain celibate and single in such a circumstance. So that's another option. Sometimes it, marriage gets so, so bad, like I, I would say, if someone was going through like a, a physically abusive marriage, I would say, for goodness sakes, let's get you out of that dangerous environment. I mean, I don't want you, I don't want you murdered, right? I don't want your kids murdered. However, we shouldn't be so quick to say, oh, that automatically go find another man and get married. I, I think, you know, there's, there, 1 Corinthians 7 says that the, the celibate single life is an option. And that's, that's what I think is, should, should be done. But now if the unbelieving depart, he says you're not bound, which I take from other scriptures to mean that they're even free to remarry. That's the way I take it. Because the, the same word bound is used in Romans 7, referring to the marriage bond. Um, it's just kind of complicated what I just said. But I, I see the issues of this. Leave the, un, leave the unbeliever and stay celibate and single. Um, if the unbeliever leaves, you're free to remarry. And ideally, uh, you're able to stay with the unbeliever and be an example of Christ to them and pray them into the kingdom of God. That, that is, that's the ideal. But there are cases where, you know, that Corinthian husband, that Corinthian wife may just be murderous. And I don't think the Bible requires a person to stay in such a situation. But I, I think that we're looking for a loophole for our own happiness and fulfillment 
all the time in our society. And my concern is if you say well, all abuse is a loophole and all adultery is a, a, a loophole, some people will provoke their spouses to ungodly behavior. Just say, aha, he was unfaithful, she was unfaithful, she's abusive, he's abusive, I'm out of here and I'm free to go find Prince Charming or my princess or whatever. And I, I, I think there is a place in, in Christianity for suffering for being patient and keeping your vows and staying with someone and praying them into kingdom. And I've seen it happen multiple times. Michelle, you just came into the kingdom of God, right? My grandmother prayed for her husband like up until he got cancer at the end. And he finally, after years, came to faith in Christ. You know, so love them into the kingdom. Be an example. Like Christ loves us and gave himself for us. There's a place for... Suffering and duty. Does that answer your question or no? Yeah. Um, worthy of a whole study in and of itself, verse by verse through 1 Corinthians 7. It's a, it's a powerful chapter that our generation doesn't want to hear, but, man, the, uh, the, the, the fa- failure of marriages in our society, our society's crumbling. It's, it, we've gotten so far. And, you know, the one thing that is often forgotten about in the discussion of a marriage is the third commandment, not to take God's name in vain. You know, that you're, you're tomorrow uh, part of the marriage ceremony for Mackenzie and Chris. And uh, they, they have a little different vows than, than I've used before. And I'm not administering them this time. Um, but the vows, you know, they, they'll say, I, it, it's a little bit different worded, what the minister says. And they, they say, I do, this is my solemn vow. Instead of just I do, I do, this is my solemn vow. And I thought, I like it. This is my solemn vow before God. In sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, till death do his part, I do, this is my solemn vow. For better, for worse, things are rough. If he or she ends up a paraplegic, and i got to change their diaper for the rest of my life. If, they, if my spouse falls into economic ruin, if, if my, my spouse has got, gets a brain injury or turns out not to be the person I thought they were, I'm, I'm going to pray for and stick through it. I mean, it's... Whew. Yeah, well, should. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a joke. That's right. You think you know, you think you know who you're married until you get married. You don't even know yourself. That's what I learned. You get married, you don't even know who you are. Yep, you change, and and you don't, and you you find yourself in situations you didn't have as a single person, and you find out like, wow, I thought I knew who I was, but it turns out I don't behave the way I thought I would behave. You know. Anyway, um, now to make a spiritual point, I mentioned earlier that that uh, that adultery, uh, that idolatry is adultery from God's perspective, and and He uses this as analogy with Israel. I, if I could read the whole chapter, it's oof, some parts of it's like you might even call graphic. So I'm just going to read a couple verses from Ezekiel 16. And, and, and he talks about how he chose Israel to be his bride, right? And then verse 14 says, And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. And he basically says, as a nation, you commit adultery with Philistia and Assyria. And he goes through this in Babylon. And then go and you commit adultery with all these foreign nations, meaning idolatry. And then those very lovers are the ones who enslave you and mistreat you. And... Um, so he uses this analogy. Israel in the Old Testament is compared to an adulterous bride. And we read about it in Numbers. You know, God gives the law of the adultery. Well, we went through it a lot in Numbers. I won't go through it again because it's getting late. Um, then we come to Jesus at his trial. And, and this sticks out to me. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, should I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. 
So he delivered him over to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus. Now, do you remember why the, 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 the Pharisees said they were crucifying Jesus, what his crime was from Jewish law? What's that? He said he was God. And said, this man, he's a man and he claims to be God. So they re- here God shows up and they want him crucified. And then Pilate says, but this is your king. And they say, we have no king but Caesar. And Caesar was a man who claimed to be God. So it's pretty ironic. It was written on his coins, son of God Augustus. This was written on Tiberius' coins, son of God Augustus. So literally a man who claimed to be God, they reject God, Jesus Christ, and they say, we have no king but Caesar. It was the ultimate act of spiritual infidelity that when the God of Israel shows up in human flesh, they want to crucify him. Um, And later on in Revelation... He'll use this analogy again. Then one of the seven angels had come with seven bowls, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the earth have been become drunk. Now, there's different interpretations of who that is, but I believe that Jerusalem is the great harlot because throughout the Old Testament, in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, the adulterous bride is Israel. And when Jesus showed up, the ultimate spiritual adultery was when they said, we have no king but Caesar. They rejected Jesus. It was, it was not to, the point I'm making is the crucifixion was the ultimate act of infidelity towards Yahweh because Yahweh had become flesh and lived amongst them. And when he did, they crucified him and said, Caesar's our king, not Jesus, right? Um, okay, it's 8 o'clock. I didn't get to the 8th commandment or the ninth. Or the 10th. But any other comments on those two? I'll stick another week in here. Hopefully get done with Ten Commandments next week. I'll try. Any other comments on this? Um, well, Caesar itself was a family name. Julius Caesar. And when Julius Caesar died he left everything to his nephew Octavian and so Octavian took the family name of Caesar as his own the word for Lord in Greek is kurios so one of the things that they would do and I'm glad you brought this up when the church started getting persecuted Christians were were told we're going to put you to death Unless you burn incense to Caesar and you say, Kaiser Kurias, Caesar is Lord. So when Romans 10, 9, and 10 says that the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith that we preach, um, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and the God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That, that confession, Jesus Christ is Lord, means he is my sovereign. He is my, my authority. And that is what brought the church into contention with Rome. Wasn't that Rome hated them singing pretty songs in their churches. What bothered Rome is that they said that, that Jesus Christ is Lord instead of Caesar. That was the whole battle. Was the first commandment, who's your God? Who's your authority? Who's your Lord? Who's your sovereign? God said, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus is that God. As Christians, we confess that Jesus is our God, our Redeemer King. And, and um, so I think maybe that's what you were thinking. The word Kaiser, is the, or uh, uh, Kurios is the word for Lord that they would use for Jesus as Lord. And any other comments on that or thoughts? summations all right so what do we talk about talk about the sixth commandment you shall not murder god looks at the heart he wants us to deal with our anger issues seventh commandment you shall not commit adultery we haven't got to eighth jordan please go ahead and use the mic it's hard to hear uh, lust is the reason for, I mean, it's the reason for you can break all the commandments for that. And you said in the beginning how Adam had broken all the commandments by, um, you know, the first 
guess the first sin was breaking all the commandments, but lust can cause all the commandments to be broken just as easily as same thing as selfishness, but those are all tied in together. It's, it's weird how all the domino falls with just a couple selfish acts. Yeah, and, and you know, James, in James chapter 2, it says if you've broken one law, you've broken them all because the law of God really is, it's all interconnected. I mean, you could take any one, you know, covetousness. Covetousness is behind theft. It's behind idolatry. It's behind adultery. It's behind oftentimes murder. It, it's behind, um, oftentimes behind not keeping the Sabbath day holy. You, you can, you can at, at least many times you can see that you commit one sin and you've really broken them all. They're all, inter- it's more like a web. It's enumerated in ten and Ten Commandments enumerated in two, and the two great commandments. It's enumerated as one, and the commandment not to eat of the tree. But really, the moral law is it's all interconnected. So when you break one, you break them all. They're all tied together. Together they rise and fall. And, um, and, and you know, the more we look at it that way, the more appreciation we have for the fact that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. If he would have broken one commandment, he would have broke all of them. But because he kept all of them, he didn't break one of them, you know. So, well, all righty. Uh, anything else? I guess it's, I did start a little late. It's 8.05. All right. Well, then, uh, Zach, you want to close us in prayer tonight? Yeah.